Good morning. I'm Mary McGinn from the First United Methodist Church in DeKalb. I'm glad to welcome you here this morning. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, and we'll be continuing with our series on looking for love in all the wrong places. At First United Methodist Church, we're all about loving, connecting, and serving. One of the ways we can connect, especially if you're a first-time guest, is to join our text messaging system. Simply text the word WELCOME to 815-605-6688 and you'll receive updates about once a week on the life of the church. Because this is the first Sunday of the month, we'll be sharing in communion later in the service. As Methodists, we believe everyone is welcome at God's table and we invite you to join in. If you'd like to participate at home, Please take a moment to gather bread and juice for everyone who is with you. We have an amazing worship team this morning. We have Gina Wisdom acting as our liturgist. Our pastor, Jonathan Crail, will lead us through the service and will share his inspiring message. And most importantly, you'll be joining us from home. Now let's take a deep, relaxing breath as we open ourselves up to God's holy presence. Oftentimes, we believe that we must deserve the love we receive. We work, work, work to get approval and to feel like our life is justified, pulling our own weight, thinking that whatever life we create and love we get is only what we ourselves can conjure up. But the scriptures today offer the image of God as our keeper, always helping, always present. Nicodemus has followed all the rules and done everything he can do, and yet he is still looking for love, for tangible connection with God. Jesus says that he must be born of the Spirit. It's not all up to simply doing the right thing. It is about allowing the Spirit to help birth love in our lives. Our first reading is from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He, will keep, he who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and your coming in. From this time on and forevermore. Our second reading is from John 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who who comes from God, but no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is this with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not, have, you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of the heavenly things? No man has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him has eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him.
As we turn now to our message, we began a series last Sunday, again, the theme being looking for love in all the wrong places. And obviously, as humans, we tend to do that, right? We look for love in all the wrong places. Unfortunately, looking for love in all the wrong places results in mere fleeting pleasure, shallow peace, leaving our hearts empty, leaving our hearts longing for something more. This season of Lent is the perfect time. It's a wonderfully reflective time to reassess where we are searching for meaning and purpose. And so we are going to and will continue to explore the stories of Jesus so that we can find out the one who offers the real deal, true love, true life, a love that satisfies our deepest yearnings, the deepest yearnings of our souls. So I invite you to pray with me for a moment as we listen to the Holy Spirit speak into our lives. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to you this day gathered around the world in many different places with much going on around us, and yet we come to center and focus on you right now so that we might truly find love and life through you. So speak into our hearts, speak down into the depths of our souls, we pray right now in Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, I remember when my son Nathaniel was born, almost 26 years ago now, I remember that day vividly when he was born and, and after his birth, how amazing it was to hold this precious little baby boy in my arms. It was, seemed almost a miracle, impossible. Now, little Nathaniel had some health issues right after birth, and so he had to be moved to a, community, or to a children's hospital uh, and he spent several days there recovering. But finally, after several days, what a thrill it was, what a thrilling day it was when the hospital staff said, you can take your baby home. Praise God. Amen. That idea was so thrilling. We got to take this little boy home with us. But I have to admit, it was also terrifying. Terrifying. I remember thinking, wow, these first few days, we've had all the support of the doctors and the nurses. But now when we go home, we're going to have this little life that will be totally dependent on Rodolin and me to take care of. I felt totally unprepared and way in over my head. What a responsibility to have someone's life literally in the palm of your hands. I mean, we had to feed him. We had to clean him. We had to dress him. We had to put him to sleep. We had to carry him from place to place. In other words, he depended for his very survival on all the things that we did for him. He was totally dependent on us. Now fortunately, praise God, he didn't stay that way. As little Nathaniel developed, he began to learn how to do things himself. He learned how to roll over, then he learned how to sit up, he learned how to crawl, he learned how to stand up, and then to take steps and to walk. He learned how to use a spoon to feed himself, and then he learned how to talk. <laughs> and I remember one day after breakfast, as I went to get him dressed, I tried to take off his pajama top, and he pushed me in way, and he said, myself. And he was saying, I can do it myself. Of course, over the months and years ahead, he learned how to do a whole host of other things by himself. Thank God, right? But one of the Crucial parts, of course, in human development is learning independence, learning self-differentiation. That's an important part of how we grow as people. And yet, especially here in our Western culture, the idea of independence and rugged individualism can be taken far, way too far in a mistaken belief that who we are and what we achieve is solely due to our own efforts and hard work. That it's all about us. We're totally dependent on ourselves and no one else. Because the reality, friends, is that unless you go live as a hermit or live on a deserted island somewhere, you are always in some manner or some way relying on the work of others, relying on the relationships you have with other people every single day. Because God made us, we are literally made for other people. And so we depend on others and they depend on us. That's what it means to be part of a community. Now in our gospel lesson, 
Nicodemus is reminded by Jesus that we are not spiritual lone rangers who gain salvation again through our own efforts, through our own work. No, we must spiritually depend on God's Holy Spirit, on the work of Christ for us. Now, let's talk about Nicodemus for a moment. He seems like a steadfast rule follower. He's a Pharisee, a sect of Judaism concerned throughout the Gospel of John with accusing Jesus of breaking the rules. They wanted to follow the rules. And so Nicodemus, in our text from the Gospel reading from John chapter 3, Nicodemus Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen with Jesus or associating with Jesus in a way that might be read by the other Pharisees as questionable. Now, Frederick Buechner, the writer, talks about Nicodemus this way. Nicodemus was a religious VIP. He had a list of credentials as long as your arm. He had advanced theological degrees, honorary doctorates, half a column in the Jerusalem edition of Who's Who. If you were a Jew living anywhere near Jerusalem in those days, you would know who Nicodemus was. You would probably recognize his face if you were passing him on the sidewalk. But as a Pharisee, Nicodemus sought to live out every law, every rule to the letter in order to be faithful to God. That sounds like a great thing. But even Nicodemus had to, at some point, dump the notion that his highfalutin religious credentials actually cut any ice with God. Nicodemus had to discover, in a way, the hard way, that he had to die to all of that in order to find true life. And that's why Jesus tells him, as he meets with Jesus in the text, Jesus answers him and says, Very truly, I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. In other words, Jesus is saying the best efforts of Nicodemus would never be enough. He needed a whole new relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, a spiritual rebirth, a birth only possible by dying to himself and then allowing God to give him true life. Now, think about that. You have to die to yourself. What, what, actually, what actually does a dead person accomplish? Well, that's the funny thing about being dead, is that the dead person is, by definition, completely unable to do another blessed thing. If you're dead, for example, the way that Jesus was dead on the cross, your only hope is that someone will resurrect you, will raise you back to new life. As the undertaker and well-known author Thomas Lynch puts it, he often points out, when it comes to dead people, you really, you really just have to do everything for them. They're no help at all. So here's the point spiritually. Our own efforts to be good, to be holy, to be faithful, to find salvation, they all lead us into a dead end. It's hopeless. But thanks be to God, that's not the end of the story. The gospel, the good news, is that when we stop trying to do it ourselves, stop trying to earn God's favor or earn the love of other people, then God is able to provide a way to new and everlasting life. And that's where that famous verse, John 3.16, comes in. For God so loved the world, including you and me, that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's where we find our hope. Now, when John says believe in, that means as in put your, put your life in, surrender everything to, join completely, believe in, share the vision. And having a vision means more than just a slogan to recite. It means actually grabbing hold of the very wind of the Spirit, leaning into the Spirit, even when it blows you maybe where you're not wanting to go, outside of your comfort zone. But we lean into God's Spirit because that is the source of our hope and our life. God is our helper. When we need help, in other words, we need to look for the helper. And that's where our psalm comes in today. In Psalm 21, we heard these words, My help comes from the Lord. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. We look to God as our helper. 
But I love Psalm 121, which starts with these words, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? Well, what is this text referring to? What is it saying? Many commentators believe that, and many Bible, newer Bible translations reflect, that when the psalmist says, look up to the hills, he's referring to the so-called high places, places of worship for pagan gods. The Canaanites would worship Baal and Asherah, and, and they would erect shrines on these high places up in the hills. And so the psalmist says, I look up into the hills saying, that's not where my help will come from. Where will my help come from? Israel had been ordered to dismantle these high places, but somehow some had stuck around and became a stumbling block for the people of Israel. Instead of following God, the one true God, they, they would follow these false idols. And so the psalmist saw the so-called, so-called help of these false religions up there in the hills, and that in turn caused him to reject those fake gods in order to embrace the real God of Israel. And as such, once the true God of Israel is identified as the only true source of help in life, the psalm goes on to talk about the kinds of things that we would look to for that God of help as we travel through life on a road trip. We might be concerned about the heat of the sun or our feet slipping on uneven paths or the harm that the moon might do to us at night in all of our comings and goings. Again, the fact that Psalm 121 begins with the psalmist lifting up his eyes only to see the allures of false comfort and fake religion reminds us that as we travel through our lives, we often too may look around and see all the things that other people have embraced as a source of help and comfort in life only to find out as a discerning pilgrim will that these things ultimately ring hollow and are a far cry from the true source of help through the Lord Jesus Christ. These things, these distractions, get in the way of us seeing and seeking real help instead of looking for false help. So in today's culture, the false gods that we worship are not Baal or Baal or Asherah, but there are so many things, right, we could name. Behind it all, of course, is probably the great idol of materialism, of money. It's all about the bling, the lifestyle, the high-end indulging of the best places, the best food, the best restaurants, the nicest cars, or the slickest new gadget. And so we get distracted from the source of, source of true hope. One, one pastor shared this illustration. He wrote that the quintessential novel that captured the essence of the 1980s was Tom Wolfe's The Bonfire of the Vanities. A year or so after this novel came out, a novel that really captured the spirit of acquisition or acquisitiveness that so characterized that yuppie decade of conspicuous consumption, a year after that, Wolf gave a lecture at Michigan State University. And among other things, he talked about the research that he did in creating his book or his novel. Because he wanted to deal with the whole sweep of life in a place like New York City, he spent time both in corporate boardrooms with their deeply uh, beveled oak paddling, paneling, and, and then he went out in the streets among gang members in the dirty back alleys of the city. And so he got a full experience of the city. But at one point, Wolf noticed that some of the gang members and other younger people he interviewed were wearing a curious kind of necklace. And when he looked closer, he realized what some of these folks were wearing on a chain like a necklace were actually the hood ornaments off of Mercedes-Benz cars. Hood ornaments that clearly had literally been torn off the front of such cars. So interesting. The cars from which the hood ornament turned necklace came from were owned and driven by the wealthy elite of New York. And that's when it dawned on Wolf, at both the higher end and the lower end of New York, it was all about the status symbols, right? Those who could afford it drove the actual Mercedes-Benz cars those who couldn't afford it donned the key symbol of luxury from the hood of those cars in the form of necklaces. But it was all the same thing ultimately, right? It was all about money, all about status. Indeed, it was the very same status symbol for both groups. 
This is the point. The temptation to reach for all the wrong things as a source of status or comfort or like Psalm 121 as a source of help are common to all of us. And so we as believers need to see all this and ask the question, well, yes, but where does my help come from? We too can lift up our eyes to the hills all around us and see what passes today as today's latest, greatest source of help in life. But it's all false and falls short. But what if we take the time and the discipline of the psalmist to yank our attention back to the one true God, the one who alone can watch over us because this is the God who loves us, who has our best interests at heart, who has all the grace needed to forgive our sins and put our feet back on level paths when we in foolishness stray off and start pursuing those alluring false gods in the hills. Yes, friends, we all need help. But rather than looking for it in empty things, we all need help, even when we don't want to admit it. But our gospel passage shows us the full extent of the help that God wants to give to us. Again, that great verse, for God so loved you, God so loved me, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, to condemn you and me, but in order that you and I and the world might be saved through him. So this week, may you look for the true helper, the one whom the psalmist says made the very heavens and the earth, the one who will not let your foot be moved, the one who will not stop watching over you, who will neither slumber nor sleep. May we recognize that God goes far beyond human constraints to watch over us and care for us as God does for the entire universe and cosmos. So that at the end of the day, again, we can never earn our way into God's graces or God's love. Or we can never do all the right things to gain some mysterious prize. But, thanks be to God, at the end of the day, we come to recognize None of that is possible without God's help. And once we receive that gift of grace, God's presence with us, God's help with us, then we are called as being made in the very image of God to then go and be helpers for those around us, for our neighbors, so that we might embody love for the world that desperately needs it. So may you find help in the true helper, and then may you go forth and be the helper for someone else around you. Amen and amen. We share together now in the prayers of the people. And in this season of Lent, we're joining together in prayer using an ancient form of prayer in the, in the ancient church. The Greek words, kieri eleison, mean God have mercy on us. And we learned a simple chant last week that we will keep repeating throughout Lent. We will be led through various intercessions or prayers in categories followed by chanting or saying out loud Kyrie response after each one. And so I invite you to join me as we now turn to prayer. First, prayers for the world. Loving Creator, we come to you asking for the strength of your help in this world. We struggle as we find so much to be chaotic and overwhelming. You set this world in motion and gave us the ability to co-create the future with you. Help us trust your presence in the midst of all that we do not understand. Show us how to love, especially when all is not within our control. We pray this day for our world. Again, remembering those people in Turkey and Syria, remembering those who have been hit hard by storms over the past weeks, whether snowstorms or tornadoes or other acts of nature. Let's take a moment to lift up these silently before the Lord. So God have mercy. In this chanting, we lift up to this world, lift up this world to you, with our love, as we say together, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison. And then prayers for our community. 
loving sovereign, we come to you asking for the strength of your help in our communities. We do not see things from the same perspective, and it's causing divisions among us. Show us how to love across these divides of how things ought to be. So many are ailing from circumstances of body, mind, and spirit beyond their control. And so we pray this day for all those in our midst who are sick, who have recently passed away, for those who are mourning loved ones. Let's take a moment to lift up whatever's on our hearts in prayers for our community. God, have mercy. In this chanting, we lift up this community to you with our love as we say together, Kieri Ileison, Kieri Ileison, Kieri Ileison. And then prayers for our relationships. Loving parent, we come to you asking for the strength of your help in our homes and relationships. Open us to feel the bond of your spirit between us and among us especially when we're not sure how to help each other. We pause in silence as we each lift up in our hearts the relationships in our lives that need your love and need your transformation. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. So God have mercy in this chanting, we lift each other up to you with our love as we say together, Kieri Ileison, Kieri Ileison, Kieri Ileison. And finally, a prayer for ourselves. Lover of our souls, we come to you asking for the strength of your help to love ourselves. Help us to break out of the prisons we've made for ourselves, believing that we have to work our way into love and acceptance. Help us really know deep down in our bones that this is your already present and ever-present love that is the bedrock of our lives and that this love can be multiplied through us in this world, in our communities, and in the lives with whom we interact each day. God, have mercy. In this chanting, we open ourselves to your love. Kieri Ileison. Kieri ileison, kieri ileison. And then, Son Jesus, who set the pattern of love in moving beyond control into the mystery of the Spirit, we pray with confidence now the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, we give thanks for God's mercy and grace for each and every one of us. And as we respond to that grace and that mercy, that loving acceptance of God, we respond in gratitude and generosity. And so as we move into this time of offering, we invite you to respond in generosity. We thank you for your partnership for all the missions and ministries of our congregation. But I want to highlight one, one place that we have an opportunity to be in mission and ministry together. And that is, on behalf of this congregation and our annual conference, I will be traveling at the end of March to Nogales, Mexico, to the border, to learn about what's happening there and how uh, families are being affected and what we might do to respond in compassion and care for people who have had very difficult and long journeys seeking better lives, seeking safety and refuge. And so uh, the organization that we'll be partnering with to learn about that is called Border Community Alliance. And we would like to take a special offering for them so that we can bring a gift down and, and deliver that so that they can continue to provide care and compassion as they care for the needs of people, again, who've had very difficult journeys, difficult lives. So as you find it in your heart to be generous, both for the ministries that we do here in DeKalb and beyond with, in this case, Border Community Alliance, we invite you to participate in that. But as always, I say thank you, thank you, thank you 
for your generosity and for your support. Amen and amen. Friends, we turn now to a time of Holy Communion, and we would love to have you participate with us no matter where you are. And so if you haven't already gathered a piece of bread and some juice, we invite you to do that right now so that you can share in this holy time of communing with God and with each other. But let us first share in an invitation, confession, and assurance. If love seems to elude, come searching at this table. For here you will find a host that does not disappoint. The feast is laid for all who come looking for love and vow to spread that love around with others. All too often, we have looked for love in all the wrong places. So in this silence, we open up ourselves to change in our paths, to seeing with new eyes, to setting aside empty promises. Let's take a moment of silent reflection. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. And then we share together in the great thanksgiving. I say to you, may love be with you all. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, love eternal, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we could not fathom your endless love and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise the name of love and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What love you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit poured out through him as he brought good news, proclaimed freedom, healed, and fed. His life of love shows us the way. His life of love delivers us from false hopes. His life, death, and resurrection offered ultimate and enduring love. And so we remember how on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then we remember how after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of this love in Jesus Christ that we offer our love completely as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. And we pray, O oh God, that you would pour out your love and spirit on all of us gathered across the internet and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the love of Christ, that we may be for the world the love of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to invite Mary to come down and as we share together in Holy Communion, as you are wherever you are worshiping with us, prepare your bread and your juice. For we take this bread, remembering that this is a gift the, the bread of life given for you and for me, the, representing the body of Christ. And so, Mary, this is the bread of life given for you. 
and we remember that this cup is the cup of salvation given for you. So share together in this. The body and blood of Christ given for us. This is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Fill us with your very self. Fill us with your love now and forever. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hear this benediction. Go forth into the world looking for love in all the right places. Go forth looking for signs of the helper, knowing that God is ever-present, urging our choice for love. Be God's people of love. Amen and amen. Now before we take off, here are some ways that you can nurture your love or put your faith into action. First of all, it's not too late to join our Lenten study, John, the Gospel of Light and Life. We offer it each Sunday following worship here in person in our Red Sea room at 10.15 to 10.30 for an hour each Sunday during Lent. So this would be part two this Sunday. And then uh, we offer it at Oakcrest at Retirement Center each Tuesday afternoon at 1.30 in their little theater. And you're welcome to join us there if you can't be here at the church in person. But either way, I invite you to study and grow this Lenten season. We have a couple update announcements from our missions team. Take a listen. Hi, two quick reminders. First, Love Inc., that is Love in the Name of Christ, is a faith-based referral service that coordinates the gifts of many churches in DeKalb and Sycamore, including our own. They're running a campaign to raise funds called Mailing in 50, during which they ask for a $50 suggested donation. Please consider giving by mailing a check to First UMC with Love, Inc. in the memo, or you can use the e-giving link at firstumc.net, use the Missions Fund, and select Love, Inc. as the sub-fund. 
Second, we're also supporting our missionaries in Puebla, Mexico with a collection. We're calling this more than a bandage. We're raising funds, $1,050, to provide a village woman with a three-week course of study, teaching materials, and a first aid kit to bring better health to her village. You can stop by the church during the week to pick up a box, or you can send your check to the church with bandage in the memo, or of course you can use the e-giving button with the missions link and then the sub fund of more than a bandage. We'll be continuing the more than a bandage campaign through the 2nd of April. Amen. And one additional item for those of you who would still like to help with our UMCOR uh, care for people in Turkey, you can give to UMCOR through our, again, through our website or mail in a check and just put UMCOR in the memo line and we will make sure that goes for caring for people in Turkey and Syria recovering from the earthquake. Hey all you hip cats and daddios. Come join Mission Possible and Christian Education as they present 50s Diner Dinner. All the ankle biters will be serving a meal Saturday, March 25th at 5 p.m. in the church dining room. We got it made in the shade with one of our delicious meals. We'll have hot dog meal, hamburger, and cheeseburger meals, all for the low, low price of $10. Well, raz my berries. Don't forget our dessert auction, as we'll be auctioning off some delicious homemade desserts. Tickets go on sale next Sunday following the service, as well as Sunday, March 19th, and at the door. You're gonna flip your lid. You'll have it made in the shade when you come on down to the dining room, Saturday, March 25th, for the 50s Diner. Tickets go on sale next Sunday. $10 a piece. Don't forget our dessert auction. And be there or be square. Hi, I'm Jason Lamb, Vice Chair of the Council on Ministry. I'll be leading the efforts as we make the transition from the current building to our new building. We have a lot to organize to get ready for our move, and to kick off the process, we'll be having a meeting on Sunday, March 19th at 3 p.m. in the dining room. At the meeting, we'll define milestones around the move and tasks that we need to accomplish to get out of the old church and be ready to move into the new one. If you'd like to play a role in the move, please join us at 3 p.m. on Sunday, March 19th. Thank you. But I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We invite you to come back next Sunday as we gather again in part three, Lent three, as we continue our series, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Until then, stay healthy, God bless you, and have a great week.